Hey everyone, uh, my name is Charlie. Um, girls will probably watch this on YouTube if you're watching this uh, at Senior Mars. And I've always wanted to kind of do this, kind of make live talks, live chats, I would say. Or I'm going to call it live talks. I just think it's a bit more um, cooler sounding than usual or not. Uh, and essentially, um, here, these are just some talks or about some topics that I've always found important. And I think right now, I really need this um, because I just want to express some ideas or things that I've been going through. Uh, so today's live talk, and because I don't kind of want to, I don't know, make it awkward, an awkward transition, um, I am going to be talking about my interests. Uh, and hopefully you find this interesting. I think that I'm going to be talking about cool ideas. Um, and I, I really hope that someone looks at this and gives me some advice because uh, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, so as I guess just to reintroduce myself as this is the first live talk, uh, my name is Charlie. I used to go by other names. Now I'm Charlie. Um, I'm changing my legal name and I go to Rice University. I'm currently a sophomore. At, well, I'm currently a sophomore and I'm studying mathematics and linguistics. Uh, but Th those are different majors. Um, they're not the same. Um, and specifically, well, when I say linguistics, I mean, I'm very interested in like cultural linguistics. Um, so something like languages and like how, you know, linguistics affects communication. I, I really like that. Um, so not like, I guess, your usual uh, semantics and phonetics. Well, I'm also interested in that, but I haven't done enough to really say I am. Uh, in either case, I just wanted to make that a, like kind of clarification because I know that some people are going to be confused if I'm going like the na like natural language processing, which I'm a bit interested in, to be honest, but not as much as, um, I guess, the culture behind it. Uh, so I guess I really just want to talk about two things. Um, and the first thing I really just want to talk about is biology and... DNA and programming languages. Um, so let's just kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, I mean, I take my notes right here, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so I wrote this little snippet uh, some time ago to get into a kind of program, um, a Google research program. Um, and honestly, I, I had this idea for a long time. Um, and I think it will be something neat that I also show you. Hopefully there's nothing private here. Oh, there we go. Uh, so again, just, I don't want this to be so long, but I will talk a bit about what the idea is. Um, so even though I'm math and linguistics, I've always been interested in kind of biology. Um, in fact, I, I guess I spent more time in my high school years doing biology than math or computer science i would say um and i i really i was not good at it partly because um uh, you know i i have like uh, learning disabilities that like make memorization not the best thing for me um and therefore you know when a, a lot of biology or like a lot of high school biology was memorized pure matters uh, pure memorization it just wasn't a, like a good thing overall. Uh, but I was extremely fascinated by the topic, uh, to say the least. Um, specifically, I was interested in genetics or molecular biology. You know, the kind of aspects I would say are fundamental to our way of living. Um, and I really had this idea uh, or like this thought that, you know, hypothetically speaking, uh, wouldn't it be cool if we could prove that DNA was turn complete? And I, I think in some ways we have, and I actually have an idea of how we can, if it's, you know, not fully established already, but there's something else I kind of want to talk about. So I'm just going to read this little snippet I made, um, because I, I really do think that it kind of conveys where my background is and how, like, this idea originally came from. 
If I had to explain why I love Lisp, Elixir, or Rust, I would immediately point out to my most beloved programming language feature, macros. At their most fundamental state, macros are a method for a programmer to manipulate their code abstract syntax to accomplish anything. From simple argument replacement to generating a boiler, uh, builder pattern template, macros are extremely powerful. Yet what catches my eyes the most is not the efficiency macros bring, but the abstraction macro represent, macros represent. Lisp is a small language, but the decision to have macros as a building block has allowed the language to survive. From one layer to the next, computer scientists can use macros to create new macros, and those macros can create another layer of abstraction. This concept introduces a recursive self-building system that mathematicians can formally verify through rigorous proofs. Ultimately, this formal system now has all the instructions it will need to keep on evolving and be correct simultaneously. As a mathematics student, this concept has excited me for so long, but what I love even more about this analogy is the ability to replace the word macros with DNA and bring forth a new and a fascinating idea. Can we formally prove that DNA, the heart molecular biology, is turning complete? Um, so you can imagine, um, I really like programming languages, or I really like kind of exploring programming languages. Um, I just, for some reason, thought compilers were really cool at the time. I went into doing some compiler work um, and some compiler projects, and I ended up, you know, having learning more about the mathematics behind uh, programming language uh, theory, which is, you know, uh, automata, uh, I guess, lambda calculus, type theory, and whatnot. Um, but I've always, at my heart, had a lot of biological ideas. Um, the truth of the matter is, um, I think that this would be something really cool, like a, a very theoretical approach, but it could lead to a lot of roads of how maybe like the mechanism for uh, DNA works. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, what really came to, down to me is um, some time ago, I was making a talk on the game of life and how essentially um, uh, people built, you know, can build a computer uh, with the game of life using just, you know, uh, basic logic components. And once you kind of represent those logic components in the game of life, you can, you know, build your way up to a computer. Hypothetically speaking, if you can find some sort of way to represent uh, or make rep the, make DNA represent those basic building blocks, uh, which are the logic gates, you know, uh, XOR and OR, um, those kind of things, you can make yourself have a computer made out of DNA molecules or, um, you know, but it, it, it doesn't really fit with me. Um, in fact, I was very, very concerned about this definition. Uh, we can make a computer and then yes, we can use our knowledge behind what we like studied for years with computer science to prove more things, but that wouldn't be that cool. Uh, in fact, the first time I saw something like this, I was looking at uh, protein, um, protein logic gates. Uh, let's see if I can find it again. Um, but yeah, I mean, here you can find some examples of how, uh, I guess, protein molecules can be represented or can represent um, gates, logic gates. And the cool thing about this, right, is that essentially, um, once you kind of have this down and you spent enough time, you can hypothetically build uh, something even like Tetris, well, theoretically, the ones you represent and make the computer. Um, but I'm pretty sure you guys know that's not how DNA works. And DNA has a bunch of instructions that we, you know, don't even look at, or I mean, exons, ions, um, and a bunch of things that make it more complicated. And DNA is not just a perfect, you know, oh, each a protein or each cell has a DNA activated in, in, like the way they need it. Um, in which case you might wonder is, well, in which case any, any reasonable person can just, um, you know, technically speaking, uh, DNA is not a perfect machine. There are, you know, even if I, you wanted to make this comparison of 
uh, can DNA represent a a computer and I guess Turing machine. Um, then you have to like think about all the inputs and outputs. It's just a, a very complicated thing. And to be honest, um, I'm very interested in like going forward with this, um, just because I think it's personally cool. I'm not sure what kind of benefits it will bring, uh, but just kind of exploring this idea on my own, it's going to be cool. I think in that kind of respect, um, I really would like some advice on how I can explore more into the field. Um, you know, I know I, I'm currently in a, I guess, in a computational biology lab, and I've been exploring like a lot of biological subjects uh, still. Like, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of field this would be formally proving things about the modular systems, probably systems biology in some way. Um, but I, I, I really do think it's cool. Um, and the reason I think it's cool is because the implications of that is that uh, all the theoretical knowledge we have proven with Turing machines we can then use with well, DNA. Um, and that would be a whole different field that people might be interested in. Um, the second thing I, I kind of really wanted to talk about is um, not the future polymers. I really wanted to talk about uh, cat theory, which I, I it's basically category theory, but I can't spell. I'm, I'm really bad at spelling category theory and linguistics. Um, so let me make it clear. Um, as I said, I really like cultural linguistics, but I can't lie. Uh, like ever since I found out that formal languages was a thing, uh, I've really been excited of just like learning more about them. Um, and I guess I, I would like to, you know, have some thoughts about this. But in, in case you don't know, formal languages are math. No, uh, math representations of what we define as languages. Um, and this is really cool because um, if you ever dealt with automata, um, you would know that it is just such a cool field. Uh, I have a couple of books that I've been kind of um, I have this book, Concepts of Programming Languages. I, of course, this is not my only resource for um, programming language things, um, but it, it's really nice cool. I have this book, um, The Essential uh, Turing, which goes around more about uh, Alan Turing and the, I guess, the work he's in. It, it turns out actually that he had a lot of biological um, accomplishments as well. And I, I really did think that was so interesting because I mean, it's the kind of things I'm interested in. And of course, read the, I mean, some theory on the land of calculus and the Turing machines, you realize that, well, they're both the same things and formal languages are just another representation of, well, a theory of computation. Uh, and of course, I also have this book, Automata and Computability, uh, a really, really great book. It, it goes on to talk more about Gold's complete theorem. Um, and just sort of other things. Um, I really re would recommend this book if you're interested in automata. Um, it also has like a lot of uh, homework sets you can do, but enough of that. I guess that's just like the mathematicians I mean, just talking about books because you know we love our books. Uh, but in either case, um, what does that have to do with category theory? Well, as some of you guys may know, category theory is, I guess, what we call superset of lambda calculus. Um, uh, well, specific lambda calculus. Um, and, well, in case you don't know, um, category theory is just essentially what we call a, uh, a metamath, which attempts to look at math, the, the, I guess the study of math, or I, I guess the, the structures of math through an abstract level. Um, so if you know something like group theory, uh, like topology, analysis, linear algebra, uh, combinatorics, so on, these are, I guess, branches of math that are very important because um, people really just, you know, think in different ways. Um, and then category theory, well, uh, some uh, theorists looked at all these branches and said, what if we just studied them in an abstract level? Or what if we look at 
kind of like the operations of what we can do with these structures and groups and like i guess like topological spaces and what can we do with them um and i guess a good way to explain that better is that um imagine you have a problem in well let's just say group theory right um group theory is what we assign a category um and then let's say that you are really stuck on this um on a problem in group theory uh let's say that you actually really like cannot go any further um and I, I heard this is really common in like math research that you're not actually using one subject entirely um so let's say you're in group theory but you can't go on further what would you do well we know that math is more about isomorphisms looking at things in different ways um that's what math is about and we know we have all these other concepts but they're essentially ways of representing or you can definitely prove a proof using so many different branches because you're looking at the same thing just in a different mindset um and if you can form isomorphism um to another branch of math and solve it there well you're set um so if we have something like you know groups and uh let's align this so we have something like tax groups and then two uh that's, that's probably okay um you will see that of course we um we start seeing this little function well this is just a two um this little function that represents well our input or our, our, our main or element of function is um let me make this more clear what i mean by this we now have a function that can take um groups let me make this more group too group theory to graph theory so now we're dealing with you know um the structures of groups and then converting them to the structures of graphs um you know and because these are isomorphisms isomorphisms we are allowed to do this since they represent and keep the same information of course we lose some information but as long as we're trying to solve the problem overall it really keeps it great it, it just helps you solve the problem easier um so we now have this function um which in category theory you call functor um and essentially that's what category theory uh, kind of tends to do in a very uh non-rigorous way or I, I just explain that not really non-rigorous um because i really just want you guys to get the point um and what i always thought about this is like yeah and now if you have the functor which is i guess a procedure to convert uh the information of a group to something like you know to a topological um figure shape dimension whatever as long as you can keep all the inf like relevant information you can now solve like you can now use the theorems uh, people have associated with uh topology to try and solve your um problem and also you know get the added benefit of what it could mean in different fields um and this has always been an amazing concept for me and i really love that math represents this um you know if you're wondering how this you know relates to primary languages well or it's not primary languages but formal languages i'll explain in a second so here we have now like you know i guess established some sort of relationship that we can we're looking at problems in different ways when we're looking at you know one versus a group theorist versus a graph theorist um and they're really essentially solving the same problem just in a different form that's I mean the definition of isomorph. Um, but have you ever thought about or essentially I am a bilingual. I was born bilingual. Uh, well, not born bilingual, but I became bilingual. Um, I currently I was you know Spanish was my first language. Um, I'm Mexican, if you can tell. Um, and I learned English 
when I came to America. Um, and after that, I have taken so many other languages. Um, so the languages, you know, that I am comfortable with Spanish, uh, German, Korean, uh, Chinese, and of course English. Well, and well, German, intermediate, Chinese, I can be considered intermediate, I'm way better at reading and writing. Korean, definitely beginner. Uh, but yeah, um, I am very interested in languages. And if you were, if you haven't had like the time to really become so like very close to a different language other, you know, like than your latest uh, tongue, you might not really know about this, but uh, essentially, when you you talk to any bilingual individual, um, you kind of come across, uh, or them telling you that sometimes they can't remember a word, or they can't represent an idea. In no, they can they can represent an idea, but like the kind of like it's not accept. Um, and let me rephrase that. Uh, they. Sometimes, you know, when we're stuck and we're not kind of like we're in a different situation and environment, sometimes people automatically switch to a different language. Um, in this case, you know, uh, sometimes I switch to from English to German, something like German to Spanish. And sometimes in my Korean class, I switch to German for some reason um, and all of that. Um, so essentially what I'm trying to grasp at is that people switch languages according to like the situation and environment. Um, in linguistics, it's that kind of idea of uh, cult, cult switching. I think cult switching is really cool. Uh, I mean, I, I've been really trying to uh, look into it more. Uh, I, I fundamentally think that it would be so cool. Um, if you can formally define a lot of cold switching. Um, but anyway, how does this idea of cold switching and linguistics and category theory switch, uh, kind of form together? Um, I, I really took a long time to think about this, but in my eyes, I think you can represent this. this. Um, Sorry, I am thinking uh, you can represent, you know, you can apply the same ideas to uh, linguistics as in English speakers or bilingual speakers who speak English and Spanish sometimes, you know, switch to Spanish automatically. Um, sometimes they look at like, you know, we know that cat is gato or well, in Chinese it's now. Um, and, um, in, I forgot what Korean, and yeah, 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 but like in German, um, we're, we're just essentially looking at the same ideas in languages, but again, because we grew up in different cultures, we represented those ideas in different ways. Um, and if, I guess if you didn't get the intention behind that sentence, um, I'm trying to claim that there is some sort of category nature about language um, in the same way that you know categories can be used to study math i really believe that categories can maybe be used to study language uh, languages uh, human languages um, but you know because category theory is a way i guess of representing can be used to represent formal languages i really do believe that there exists a lot of things in which we can use math to apply to linguistics uh, for education. Um, and I kind of like the inverse as well. Like if, if we can figure out, like formally define this connection, or if I can formally define this connection, um, then I think it would be really cool uh, to then say, hey, maybe all these things that people have been learning about human languages can be applied to uh, mathematics for students. I really care about education. So like being able to see this kind of connection, it was extremely cool for me. Like, um, what if, you know, 
the same way that people like people only really learn languages when they are young. Uh, maybe the key to express when you start learning about different branches of math at your earlier ages, it, it may be easier for uh, some sort of claims like that. Like if we can represent these kind of ideas in other multi uh, interdisciplinary fields, I really believe it would be great insights to how humans work uh, in a pen, it's just because it's mathematics. I'm very interested in it. Um, well, and ultimately, I, I really, it, it's more like if these two ideas that I've been kind of thinking about are semi-right, then I am sure there's a link between all three of them. And that's kind of like, even though these ideas seem so far off from each other, I really do think that it's cool. Uh, and I just want to explore it more and more. Um, so thank you for all, thank you all for watching this. Uh, hopefully this caught your interest. Hopefully you thought something about it. Uh, if you can give me some advice, I would really love it. Um, again, I'm just a sophomore, but I'm really thinking of multiple ideas and I think these are cool ideas. Um, so yeah, have a nice day.